Welcome back, my friends, to Shoe Leather Faith, a study in the book of James. The last session we looked at was a passage that is a portrait of repentance. Repentance is an act of humble submission to God, which includes a choice, a choice to resist the devil and to draw close to God, a commitment to moral purity, both externally and internally, and a genuine remorse for one's sin literally is a 180 degree turn from sin to Christ. Friends, it's time for us to take an honest look at ourselves, our lives, our actions, and our reactions to the situations around us. InterVarsity Press says of this next session, section, James could have ended this section at this point, having directed his readers with steps toward God. He's unrelenting, however, in making the explicit application to the problem with which he began, the problem of anger, impure speech, and judging within the Christian community. He introduced this topic as early as chapter 1, verse 19, and he focuses on the aspects of judging and discrimination in chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. He returned to the issue of impure speech in chapter 3, verse 1, and specifically the problems of cursing and envy and fighting through chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. Now he drives home his call of life and faith in personal relationships. So today, let's focus on the next thing in James' epistle, chapter 4, beginning with verses 11 and 12. I'm going to read from the ESV. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. This one who speaks evil or against his brother and judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? He then begins this short section with guns ablazing and couldn't be more clear as he boldly challenges us in our relationships. The first is our relationship to our brethren in Christ. James tells us, do not speak evil against or slander one another. Nothing unclear about that. The verb here to include or could include destructive verbal attacks, gossip behind another person's back and false accusations. Such offenses are not to be practiced amongst Christians. Now, we never do that sort of thing, do we? We're just sharing what we have, sharing what we have heard for prayer, because we're concerned about our sister in Christ. Hmm. Well, let's start at the beginning. Barclay says, speak evil translates the ancient Greek word katalalia. Katalalia is the sin of those who meet in corners and gather in little groups and pass on confidential information which destroy the good name of those who are not there to defend themselves. What a perfect portrayal of gossip and slander. He couldn't have said it better himself. What is gossip? Gossip is the casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people typically involving details that are not confirmed as completely true when that person is not there to defend themselves. What actually is slander then? It's actually the uh, crime and a uh, crime of making a false statement or a skewed inference, which is damaging to a person's reputation. The legal definition is it's called oral defamation in which someone tells one or more persons an untruth about another, which untruth will harm the reputation of that person defamed. Slander is a civil wrong, and it can be a basis for a lawsuit. Let's note here that this is not dealing with discerning between right and wrong issues, but rather sharing wrong issues with those it does not involve and should not be confided in. It's an interest, it is interesting who James talks first about not speaking evil. James 4, verse 11, he says, one another. 
That's a Christian brother or sister. Those whom we are supposed to love and care about. Those who are part of the family of God with us. Those who have been to the cross just as we have and been forgiven just like ourselves. They aren't strangers, but they're personal, intimate, spiritual relatives, so to speak. Let's read Matthew 7, verses 1 to 5, or at least a portion of that. Jesus is talking here about judging one another. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. Take a moment, my friends, and think about what happens to a church when people start judging each other in this way. We've all seen it, maybe been hurt by it ourselves, or have participated in hurting others with it. It never ends well. Slander and gossip creates great hurt and deep ruin and destruction in the lives of everyone. It's destructive. It's not helpful. It brings much pain and ruins the testimonies of those involved and actually the reputation of the church. Christian fighting is devastating at its best. Many a soul has walked away from the Lord completely, not because of anything God has done himself, but shaking their heads at the biting and devouring church members have done to each other. If you've ever been on the receiving end of those cutting jabs, you know how tough it is to put it behind you. Wounds from those who are supposed to love you and accept you run deep. I had someone say to me once, my non-Christian friends would never do to me what your Christian friends have done to you. That's the result of gossip and slander. Maybe your translation here uses the word neighbor, meaning our neighbor in Christ, our sister or brother, a co-member of your heavenly family in the Lord. Matthew uses the same term in chapter 22, verses 37 to 39. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's talking about your Christian brother or sister. It reminds us that our, our family bonds, bought through God's mercy, are violated when we who have received mercy turn to judge someone who else who has received mercy. And we turn with contempt towards someone else who is our brother or sister in Christ. We must remember that when a non-Christian behaves badly, they're just acting like who they are, unredeemed. When we act that way, we are really acting in opposition to Christ. It's an affront to our position, to what Christ has done for us, and to God himself. This does not mean we never challenge another believer, but we must do it right. It must be honest and truthful and face-to-face, -face, not roundabout in some corner with someone else. It needs to be direct. When God impresses on my heart to challenge someone, I must do it with much prayer, much humility, and gentleness, and I need to examine my own heart and motives. As the verses were saying, to check the log for the log in my own eye. I must be certain that it's accurate and it's true. I must share God's stand on the action and reaction, but not my own. Remember, God's law is not a tradition. Just because we have always done it that way doesn't make it God's ruling. God's law is given by God only, not old Uncle Joe. If I don't have a clear scriptural basis, then it's not God's law, and I have no authority from which to speak. The second is our relationship with the law. Ask yourself, who is the doer of the law, and who is the judge? I am supposed to be the doer of the law. God is the judge. Psalm 50 verse 6 says, the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is the judge. Leviticus 19, verses 15 and 16 say, You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. 
Sound familiar? Jesus quoted it in Matthew 7, verse 1. Do not judge, so that you may not be judged. James's point is that if we accept God's mercy through Christ, we place ourselves under Christ's law, which commands mercy. If we then judge others instead of being merciful toward their faults, we are rejecting the law and so setting ourselves up as judges over the law. This contradicts our proper stance as recipients of grace. We're to be doers under the law, not the judge. That's God's job. Certainly we're not we're to be conscious and encourage one another to obey the law, which means we are not to be silent and look the other way. But in love, as a redeemed fellow follower of Christ, we should challenge one another to obey and keep the law of Christ. The third point is our relationship with God. God alone. Let me say that again. God alone is the lawgiver and judge. How we approach others with judgment demonstrates what it actually is in our own hearts. Luke 6, 42 and Matthew 7, 1 to 5 are very familiar verses. And they say this. Let me finish that section. I hadn't read it all the way through first. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck that is in your brother's eye. This provides a revealing insight into our hearts. In judging people, what we are really trying to do is set ourselves higher than another, to take God's place. In the realm of personal relationships, however, judging and law-giving operate together. The one who judges, another person is presuming to have authority over that person, to set the law or standard by which that other person is judged. Judging is an attempt to be in control as God is in control, which has been our rebellious desire since the, the serpent spoke to Eve and said, you can be like God, knowing good and evil. Our sin of judging, um, our attempts to set ourselves not only over the law, but over the lawgiver himself. Sometimes it's just to make us look better. I recall a very vivid illustration of that in one of our churches. There was a couple who were controllers in the church. They worked to make others aware of their high standing. They gave generously. They were very wealthy people. They gave generously to the church body and gave large donations to Bible school close by. She even tried to buy me lavish personal gifts in order to make me beholding to her so she thought she could control me. They held positions of influence in the church and in the community and controlled others through intimidation and fear. They would look down their spiritual noses and chastise people for playing cards while behind the scenes were having illicit immoral affairs and shady financial dealings themselves. One would like to think that eventually they were, when they were found out, that the truth would have been exposed, but they still held up the facade of being the spiritual elite. They both had, have gone on now to, to be judged before the Lord, where I'm sure it was all laid bare. Meanwhile, the others in that community knew what was going on and despised the church and God and the message because of their blatant hypocrisy. Folks told us they would never darken the door of that church because of those people. And after we resigned from the church, there were townspeople who approached my husband on the street and said, good for you. It's about time someone exposed what was going on there. All the community knew and it destroyed the impact of the message of Christ. The message of Christ had in that, had in that town and beyond and I think, I believe it still is there under the surface. It's not hard to figure out what was behind this kind of thing. The relationship with God was probably non-existent, but they had to keep up appearances of being great Christian leaders when in reality they were lost and were destroying many, many lives with their activities. 
the moral of this is to be careful when you judge another that your life is clean before the Lord. I realize that no time in life that I will be sinless and perfect, but I need to regularly ask the Lord to deal with any iniquity in my heart, especially before I go to another to encourage them. I must always go with the spirit of deep humility and meekness. It's called walking in the spirit. Daily asking for cleansing of my walk with the Lord and being humble, realizing that though I am one with Christ in my salvation, I'm still learning to obey, striving to be pure and walk holy. I'm not perfect yet. I ain't got there yet. I shared last session about the two positions of sanctification. One is our positional sanctification. My standing as a redeemed child of God, holy and acceptable to God because of the blood of Christ. He stands in front of me. And when God looks at me, he sees Jesus' blood and says, she's, she's clean, she's righteous. Then there's the practical sanctification, my journey of faith in life, my growth as a believer, becoming more like Christ in my daily walk. It, both are very real and important forms of sanctification. As we close for today, we must always remember four things that are imperative to recognize and apply before we approach any brother or sister to challenge them. The scriptures tell us that God, that God is the only righteous impartial judge. Psalm 9 verse 8, and he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. We are to share the judgments he has already passed down, not to adjust them or to suit our purposes and to control others or to look good. There's no verse that I found in scripture that tells me I cannot play cards. There are verses that warn me about gambling, but not playing cards and playing games. The verse in Numbers 32 verse 23, which I learned as a child, warns us as it did the Israelites before they went to battle to cleanse their hearts. Why? Because, as it said, be sure your sins will find you out. My grandma's paraphrase of that uh, paraphrase of that was, what goes around comes around. God will expose your heart, your motives in your life, if you proudly bully your way around others in order to control and manipulate them. Secondly, God is the judge of the wicked and the righteous, not me. Psalm 50 verse 4 says, He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. God alone is the creator of the law, not me. I find it clearly laid out in scriptures, in the pages of scriptures. He judges us all by his holy law. Third, God will judge me first. Hmm. According to his holiness and purity, and I need to heed that ruling. Psalm 50, 35, verse 24 says, Judge me, O Lord God, according to your righteousness. Psalm 139, 23 is one we most of us know. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Once again, I must let God examine my heart and make changes where I ought to before I approach anyone else. Number four, God can and will give insight into his ways as I study his word and as I apply it first to my own life. Apply it first to me and then I share it with others. Psalm 25 verse 4, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. And Psalm 51 verse 13, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. I pray that you will think about these words as I, and apply them to your own life as you seek to walk first in obedience before the Lord and then to encourage, exhort, and challenge with the love and humility of those believers around you with, uh, with only that which is true, not slanderous or gossip. Really, the scripture calls us to disciple and train others. That means mentoring, helping to train up and encourage your spiritual family members around you to walk in accordance with God's word. Let's close with that verse that we all know, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture 
is inspired by God, God the judge, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Father God, I just pray that you will open our eyes and our hearts to our own state, our own being. Help us to be humble, to deal with the sin in our own life before we go marching into someone else's. But Lord, I pray too that you will help us not to be fearful, but to challenge one another with the truths of the scriptures. All scriptures inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Amen. See you next time. Thank you.